All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live. My name is Josh Corporal, and I am streaming live from Key West, Florida. And today we've got special guest Rob Sales on the line. Rob, welcome to Fire Builders Live. Hey, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Me as well. This is going to be great. Now, before we get into what we're going to be talking about today, building teams, how to balance creativity and productivity, which is something that every team leader ends up running into at one point or another in their career. Uh, before we get into all of that, if this is the first time that you are watching Fire Builders Live, what we do is we bring on these experts, we take big topics, big goals, we break them down into small steps, things that you can do every day to remain consistent because consistency is key and that's how change is made. And today is gonna to be an awesome episode. I've honestly been looking forward to this ever since we organized this whole thing, Rob. Basically, we're gonna be talking about how to, how to systematize, how to create systems in your team so that people can communicate and they can be creative and yet still be as productive as possible. And Rob is the perfect person to be talking about this topic with because over 20 years, you have worked along giants like Sony, like Fujifilm, Facebook, Sky TV. You've done stuff with ClickFunnels. You've basically driven more than $100 million in sales across thousands of client campaigns. So you know what you're talking about when it comes to you know executing ideas, whether they're big or small. You're a huge proponent of Toyota's Kaizen principles, which if you don't know what those are, it's basically the principle of continuous improvement. And you're a believer in the power of, you know, manifesting not only a team of people that are able to do something, but willing to do something. And that's by developing a culture. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And it's not like you're just preaching this. You have actually, you've got your own successful global digital agency called Flint. So you're an agency mentor. You're a strategic consultant. You're also the founder of this, of this agency. So man, I'm excited to have you on the show. Welcome again, Rob. Thank you. Where do you want to start, my friend? I know, I know, seriously, it's too much. <laughs> Dude, let's start with it. What, what is the next tattoo you're gonna get? Oh, there is a question. Now I've got, I've got a ton of stuff on here that tells a story and I won't tell the whole story. I've got the startings, there's a, there's a wolf up there. Okay. And there's okay. A, a, a deer, oh God, which way, it's that way. It's kind of upside down, but there's a deer here. And I think the plan is, is to develop a, a, a little red riding hood, like an English oak tree type story somewhere down the arm with the, you know, the big wolf and little red. So, I like it and like make a whole sleeve of it. That's the plan. That's the plan. I dig yep. it, man. I love it. Yeah. I love it, it. it was very, very strange in my corporate days having to cover all of these things up. Um, did, did they make you do it? They like asked you? with the long sleeves and everything yeah when i when i did the corporate stint doing all the kind of digital strategy and operation work um, for a big multinational um it was frowned upon it, like they didn't say directly but it was clear that there was a certain sort of you know apprehension or a certain sort of uh stereotype thinking going on in people's minds that hey this guy knows what he's doing but oh he's got tattoos maybe he's we not can't really. trust him yeah this is crazy <laughs> But all of us do it. All of us kind of judge a book slightly by its cover. So I don't blame them for that. But when I stepped out of corporate and started my own agency, it was like, yes, I can just wear black T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everybody listening has had parents at one point in their life say, don't get that neck tattoo. You're going to need to get a job one day, you know, something like that. And so I can completely well, relate to that. My very first... Um, was uh, and you can actually see it hidden underneath the wolf. The wolf is a cover up for a very rubbish tribal tattoo on my arm. And I remember I got it with a load of mates. We went out drinking. I was about 17 and I'd wanted one for ages, but I knew that mum and dad would hate it. And I got really sick, not like sick from drinking, but I got really poorly with a fever. I had a tattoo and I don't think it was that tattoo that made me ill. But I got a really bad fever, and I remember being in bed, you know, tossing and turning, and mum coming in with drinks and things. And I was subconsciously trying to keep it covered up, 
But obviously, you know, you're laying in bed and you're really ill and you're flopping around and all the rest of it. And she spotted it. And I remember thinking, shit, I am, <laughs> I am so going to get grounded now. And, and that, that, yeah, started my whole uh, love affair with tattoos. I feel like if you're ever going to expose something like that, though, that might be the best time because they already feel sorry for you. It's not like they can, uh, you know, <laughs> like punish you or anything at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're yeah. already sick. You're already suffering. Uh, but, uh, but, well, dude, welcome to the show. Um, I yeah. love that you're here. Thank you so much for taking the time. The way that I like to start this off is, uh, you know, where are you in the world and what is a typical day in Rob's life look like these days? So I am East Coast UK. Uh, we're right next to the beach in a tiny little uh, fishing town. Moved down here with the kids um, probably about 15, 16 years ago, just for a change of quality of life. We've got pine woods and beaches and a town that's probably two and a half, three thousand 3,000 people. You know, it's, it's, it's tiny and it's perfect. So long as I've got an internet connection, we can do what we do. I mean, this is the beauty probably of, of what's happening to a lot of businesses now is we've all got an opportunity to actually create business online. Um, I've got team members all over the globe. I've got clients all over the globe. I'm regularly riding in time zones, which can be a killer. But um, yeah, <laughs> between America, uh, all of Europe, Hong Kong, Australia is just you know constantly juggling time zones and, and working with crazy interesting people yeah I, and that's uh and you're right about the time zone thing too it's it is so hard sometimes to keep all of that straight and uh i've missed many a meeting because of that uh really messed some things up but but you're right about the fact that uh i love this type of lifestyle i love the fact that all you need is an internet connection um and and what is it now that you're that you're doing for these clients you have a whole team you've got a worldwide clientele sort of Rolodex. Um, yeah. For the most part, what have you been helping them with? Well, I've actually got two businesses. So I work uh, as a, a consultant and an advisor and a mentor for businesses that are looking at developing business strategies that are aligned with marketing strategies that are aligned with digital marketing strategies. Because a lot of businesses are not good at taking their core vision and values and actually making something you know, truly transforming in the digital space. So I've got a business that does consulting with clients doing that sort of stuff. I also own an agency that does automations and systems and digital marketing, um, predominantly, uh, you know, big, crazy funnel systems. We do a lot of media buying for Facebook and Instagram. Um, and the two do relate to each other. There's quite a lot of the time, I'll start working with new partners or clients doing the consulting and it transpires that they then need production work doing. And, and, you know, we've got an agency that's been doing that for years as well. I feel like uh, that when you consult with these people and they, they, you start to bring new ideas to the table that they're not actually equipped to, with the, with the team or the, you know, the possibility to execute on what you guys talk about, which is perfect for you because then you say, well, I've got this whole entire team right here that uh, yeah. that can help you if you need it, and uh, and so I totally agree. I is it more, is it more that they're developing these ideas from scratch and they don't know where to start, or do you come in halfway through and say, whoa, 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 like what the hell are you guys doing? You know, it's chaotic. <laughs> it's a car wreck in your terminal. Yeah. Like, you know, what um, what have you found most that is the situation that you're kind of put in? I, I think it, it split one of three ways. There are businesses, you know, whether they're startups or serial entrepreneurs or whatever that are looking at doing something new and they quite often need an end-to-end -end solution mapping out before it, it goes to production. So it's, you know, that kind of architecture or engineering process of designing something and getting it all sorted out and blueprinted so that it can then be produced properly. So that's that that's one type, you know, the kind of startups or the serial entrepreneurs. The second type that I've noticed a lot more is businesses that are already doing something online, but they're not hitting their goals. And part of the reason for that is what's happened with COVID is there's a lot of businesses that have realized that their digital stuff 
is woeful. You know, it, it, they don't have an option for bricks and mortar or footfall anymore. So they're trying to transform into the digital space and they just don't know where to go. They have some things, but none of it really works very well. And the third situation that I do quite a lot with consulting is actually getting helicoptered in to do consulting with other agencies. So there are some very big Facebook and Google and, and digital marketing agencies out there that hire me to come in and basically kick the tires on the campaigns that they're doing for their clients and, and kind of give them a fresh set of eyes and strategic direction. Is it is that strategic direction more of a creative thing or is it, it the way that they have organized the execution of that creative? It, it's both. And, and for me, I, th I think all of this kind of story, all, all of what we're talking about is about the marriage of creative and technical. Um, there's a certain amount of, of framing and messaging and storytelling that's needed. And, and sometimes businesses and agencies don't know how to do that particularly well. And then there's the execution of it. You know, what are we doing with these audiences? What do we do to increase the stickiness? What do we do to make the conversion better? And most importantly, once we have customers, what do we do to keep them, to make them loyal, to make them brand ambassadors, to have them buy more things from us and for us to to support and serve them? Um, there tends to be kind of 20 touch points in any campaign and, and most businesses and a lot of agencies, you know, maybe only cover five. And <laughs> there's great big gaping holes where they're pouring more budget into marketing campaigns and not actually fixing the leaks and improving the little things that can actually, you know, massively increase the conversions. Well, so before we kind of get into that, because I agree, it's about like, you know, marriage of the technical and the creative, something that you yeah. said that I just want to touch on. Have you actually been helicoptered in like in the middle? I, you know, <laughs> I, I think about that, like, like you get a call in the middle of the night and they're like, Rob, we need you right now. There's a chopper outside. That would be amazing. I, I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if there was an advert running in the, in the U S but in the late seventies, early eighties, I think there was an advert and it used to be at the cinema a lot. And it was the man from milk tray. And it was, you know, there's a Cadbury's, the big UK chocolate manufacturer had got these, you know, boxes of chocolates. And the kind of marketing angle was that this mysterious man would come into this woman's villa in the middle of the night and leave chocolates and then leave again. Uh, you know, he came in in a big black helicopter and he got a big black kind of ninja suit on and a box of chocolates and a rose. And he did what he needed to do. And then he left again. And to answer your question, no, I haven't, but it will be really cool. I feel like you're on a trajectory that that's probably going to happen <laughs> here in the near yeah. future, you know? Yeah. Uh, plus, like you're, you know, you're kind of a remote place in the UK. So, you know, they might have no choice. It's either that or send a boat. Uh, it, but, well, it's an interesting one. And, and, and COVID had an impact on that, to be honest with you. I mean, we've had a virtual agency having been in bricks and mortar agencies and seeing how businesses work, you know, face to face and building teams in office buildings, that kind of thing. Um, I decided to go a different route with the agency and build a completely virtual one. And it's quite difficult until COVID where people are, you know, expect you to travel to meetings. And it's been interesting seeing the dynamic change. And I know that people get zoom fatigue and it's a very different discipline working from home. But everybody all over the globe had to learn to cope with it, and and you know it changes the dynamic of meetings, but it, it makes it it makes you much more flexible. It makes you much more available to actually help other people and support people. And and I would imagine it just in some sense provide more quicker. However, I do think I'm curious when you go. Like I would imagine that when when you were actually physically going to some of these places and you were going through meetings. Part of your evaluation of the situation was to be able to read the body language, to read the team and see how everybody's yeah. working together. Now that that's been almost taken away, um, have you found that that's made your job that much harder to consult and to... It, it has if people are, and I don't mean dishonest in a negative way, but if people are guarded about what it is that they say or what they do, I've been, I've done operations management and scaling services and things for agencies. And I, I mean, I've been around agencies so long, particularly um, coming from the digital industry, 
I can walk into an agency building and almost immediately tell what it is that, you know, how they perform, how the team works, how they are maximizing themselves, what kind of problems they might have without talking to them, just by looking at body language and interactivity. Um, and it's very hard when you're talking to a group of 12 people on a, you know, Muppet show style. Oh, it's all heads, yeah. 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 You know, if, if people choose to be guarded and, and perhaps, you know, they're guarding the body language or they're nervous about being on Zoom, it's like there's an extra layer of complexity that as a consultant, you've got to help guide them through the process of breaking it down so that you can work out what you're playing with and then put everything back together again. When you would physically go into these places, but now you're kind of digitally doing the same thing, how do you start? Um, you know, how do you, what are, what's kind of the process? Where do you, in your experience, have you found like the process of, all right, uh, first got to get to know everybody, maybe, maybe do individual interviews, things like that, understand the process, but then, but then where does it go from there? I think, whether we're talking about an agency or whether we're talking about business generally, there are normally two, not necessarily if it's just a startup, but there are normally like a yin and yang. There's a dichotomy. And it comes from what the business wants to achieve and creatively what it's it's currently doing or, or the trajectory that it's taking. Those two things can be quite polar opposite. You know, you, you talk to the founder or the CEO and they will have an idea of what they want the business to achieve you know, across its strategic plan or, or, or its manifesto or whatever else. And then you talk to the guys that are, and girls that are actually working in the team and they're quite often, they might be oblivious, but they're quite often moving in a different direction. So what I tend to find is what I like to do is spend some time with a business owner, not reading the, the bump that they've put out there about what the business is for, but actually asking them like, where are you at? What is it that you want to achieve? You know, have you actually set out some goals? What are your OKRs and KPIs and objectives and all the rest of it? And then very quickly go and spend some time actually on whatever you want to call the shop floor, you know, with the guys and, and, and the people that are actually doing the work, just roaming around and seeing what it is that they're actually up to. And you'll find that there's a cultural gap. What I like to do is try and bridge that cultural gap, you know, bring the, the big business vision and the, what the guys are doing and actually bring the two together. And, and that's kind of the marriage of the creative and the, the process driven. Um, the interesting one is when you're working with entrepreneurs or startups, because quite often there'll be two or three founders and they'll all have slightly different points of view. And sometimes they'll yeah. clash and sometimes they'll align, but trying to get a clear picture from a small group of founders can be quite difficult sometimes. So again, that's part of the process of, of kind of digging deep and finding out what's going on. And then I would imagine that if you do find a dissonance in, in different founders' ideas of where the trajectory should go, and then on top of that, you go and roam the floor and you see that the workers have like, you know, maybe not a completely different 180 degree idea of where it's going, but a, just a different end goal for themselves. Yeah. Getting everybody on the same page is like, it's like, you know, the primary directive, you know, it's the first thing that you want to do. Um, yeah. Do you, do you end up like mediating between parties to, to help them all land on the same goal? Yeah, pretty much. I think a lot of it is about understanding what productivity actually is and then understanding how to enable it and improve it. And then effectively having, you know, the, 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 the management, the founders take responsibility for continuously driving and nurturing that culture as it emerges there's there's quite often in a lot of businesses a you know serious lack of culture there's like a a breakdown in the dna and trying to put that back together again and then have people take ownership and pride in it so that it's instilled from the top all the way through the organization you know that's where you start then getting uh, free flow and you start getting very enterprise uh, enterprising people and you start getting you know productivity in places that you would have never imagined because people are become very very passionate and very team driven and they'll overcome more and more problems rather than just treating everything as a nine to five where they you know they clock in they take the money they clock out again which is kind of what you want to avoid the idea is is to you know have that true sense of team and have everybody move in the same direction if people don't end up, you see anyway, if they don't end up having that sense of team, or for instance, the breakdown in DNA, as you put it, yeah. 
simply because you don't have like these concrete pillars that everyone can rest upon, right? Whenever they're wondering what they're doing, like, you know, everybody's, everybody's had that job where they're sitting there drinking coffee saying, what, you know, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, what am I doing with my life? You know? Uh, but if you don't have that concrete pillar to say, or pillars to say, look, this is the reason, this is the why, um, then you get that DNA breakdown. And where do you draw the line between trying to encourage everybody to get on the same page with a company's, um, you know, dy like their goals, but at the same time, encourage individual creativity? I think part of that, part of that, that is down to the, the creative structure of the team. And part of that is down to not actually compartmentalizing people too much into particular roles. Um, you know, it may be, and, and this is what's happening a lot right now with in the UK anyway, with, you know, furlough and risk of redundancies and businesses going under, you know, towards the the, the kind of autumn or the fall. I think there's going to be a, a big societal change in the way that businesses actually operate, whether some of them can continue to operate profitably. Um but I think a lot of it is down to, you know, what John, Sally, Tim, what what have you, you've got this job, you've got this role, you do it pretty well, but like, what are your aspirations? You know, what else can you do that you really want to dig into? You know, can we actually play around with your role? Can you bring something else? Can you change your career path within the organization to make the organization stronger? There was a guy that I worked with, years ago he was an incredible um kind of middle layer technical developer but he was also insanely good at creative and pitching and you know coming up with big ideas and he used to sit there and just hammer away at his keyboard and kick out all this incredible code but nobody had really spent the time with him to find out like what he really loved doing what he was true genius at and once we tapped into that, you know, kind of replacing his technical role wasn't that hard. But suddenly we've got this powerhouse in the agency that could come up with insanely big ideas and win all these pictures and wow all these clients simply by taking the time to find out whether somebody had got a hidden talent that the business actually needed and then building the business, you know, slightly around that talent. And I, I think that's... It's more true with corporations where there are just great big silos that HR, you know, kind of put people into into uh, job roles and they keep them there for 10 years. And then you get your, you know, your golden handshake and you retire and all the rest of it. And that's where a lot of job frustration comes from. And that's where people clock in and do the nine to five because they think, well, I don't really care. I'll just do my job. You know, I don't really want to do anything else. If you can actually in inspire people to bring something to the table, then you can, you can nurture that and you can start to build on that. Yeah, completely. I mean, I feel that most people do that same thing where either they, they get resentful because they don't feel like they're in a capacity to become creative. And so why grow, you know, why not just, just like you said, clock in, clock out, get my money and be done. But at the same time, uh, that they're too, you know, that maybe they feel like, Hey, I'm, I'm just too old to start something new. Like, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to go there. I don't want to be in that position anymore. So I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing. And I feel like that's just such a vicious cycle psychologically uh, with people. Um, I, th I think so. And I, I think what's important for businesses to know as well is that there's, you know, there's massive changes in, in, society and business structure and, and, and employee satisfaction or contractor satisfaction or whatever like a lot of people are thinking about things that they never thought about before because every single country across the globe has been faced with something that it's never really had to deal with so there's a lot of people that are thinking okay i've got my job i'm safe i can pay the rent i can pay the mortgage i can put some food on the table but do you know what? Is it something that I really want to be doing now for the next 10 years? Some people have taken the time off because they've been sent home to retrain and to think, you know, seriously look inwards at themselves and think about their lives and what it is that they really, truly want to achieve. So I think a lot of business owners need to be mindful of that and kind of think about, well, do we move people around a little bit? Do we actually accept that some people might want to leave they might want to go somewhere else or whatever and kind of structure the organization around you know building as productive a team as you possibly can that's as loyal and powerful as it can be well along that line the first per or the first question that i like to ask guests 
is, and we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but I'll bring this up on the screen, right? Yeah. The, the idea that if you are a team leader or you're a business owner and you have a team and you want to maximize creativity and at the same time in parallel productivity, uh, where would you suggest that people start? If it really is, and maybe it's not, but if it really is getting to know people, like figuring out how they're dynamic and not siloing them into these boxes, how would you suggest that um, that, that, that that task is kind of done? I think a lot of it comes down to being very clever with productive time and actually creating time that is not, you know, work. That sounds really crazy, but if you can, if you can make the time every day to spend with your team members or your staff or your, you know, department or whatever else, just and it's slightly harder virtually, but to find out a little bit about people, to actually break down some of the, the typical kind of job role profiles and barriers that we all have, that could be like Friday afternoons off for everyone where you just come up with some crazy stuff. Or it could be that, you know, managers and middle managers and heads of department actually go and spend some time and, and learn about what makes people tick because you'll start to see patterns rather than seeing what you want to see. You'll actually see the truth. And once you see the truth, you can work out what to do with it. But until you get to that point by dedicating some, you know, downtime, some non-work time within work, to try and suss that out, you're never really going to see the truth of it. You're going to see, you know, the kind of structures that you've put in place, but not a lot more. You'll just see drones rather than people. That's how, like, uh, that's there's that story about how graphene was invented, right? You know, like uh, that one, like, single layer of carbon atoms, and, uh, and it's just got all kinds of insane uses. But uh, that's how they, I think they figured it out at 3M. But that's what they did is that they just had that downtime, all these employees, and they were using company resources. And then lo and behold, like, you know, they yeah. just they, they made an incredible discovery. So I feel like that happens. One of, one of the agencies that I worked at, we created, I, I had a, a big argument with the, the, uh, the bosses and the HR guy and the finance guy because I was looking after a big resource pool, like all of the production staff. I was doing operations management. And I basically floated this idea to the, the board that we were going to take Friday afternoons off. You know, I, I, I was stopping production. I wasn't going to have any active work running through the studio at all. Um, and we created these digital garages. And it was literally, guys, you've got, you know, three consecutive Friday afternoons, open brief, but you have to go away with your equipment do whatever the hell that you want to do as a team. You know, there's eight of you, uh, creative and a technical and whatever else. Go and do some stuff, something that inspires you or fascinates you or something that you've seen that might be a good opportunity. Go and design it and build it and bring back a prototype and present it to everybody else. And, you know, you get downtime to basically go and play. I know they do it at Google and Facebook and various other places a lot. Um, the team building from that, and the stuff that we created, there was some stuff that we were doing in the studio that took months. These guys spent three Friday afternoons and they built the most incredible prototypes and ideas. Just cracking it, it out. Yeah, and, and the juniors learned how to present and the seniors spent more time with the juniors, whereas before they were all kind of in their own little bubble. Um, the productivity went through the roof, but I had to overcome as an ops manager like that argument to say me taking 100 people out of a resource pool doesn't mean that we're losing chargeable time. What it actually means is we're investing in research and we won loads and loads of awards and pictures and stuff because we were the agency that was coming up with cool stuff when all the other agencies were churning out the same old shit. Um, and, and that just comes from taking some time out. I feel like uh, the people that you were arguing with probably were so pessimistic about people. You know, like as yep. soon as you say, hey, we're going to give these people some time off, that they, what they hear is, oh, they're just like, we're going to pay them and they're going to be lazy. They're going to be walking around and not going to be doing anything. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay them for that. Like, make them work. Uh, well, th th this is the thing. And I think from having a, a virtual business and a lot of other businesses will be going through this now, this whole process of remote teams and things. 
there's a distinct difference between non-chargeable time and productivity like massive productivity isn't something that is just about you know you have to do seven and a half hours a day of this thing if you think about all of us as human beings like sometimes when we're hit with a big problem it's like your brain just melts and the only thing that you want to do is like run away and go and stare at the beach or you know go and read a book or go and walk the dog or go and spend some time with the kids you know that the problem's there yet weirdly when you go and do that stuff when you like force a procrastination you quite often the, the back of your brain comes back with a solution and it's like hang on a minute so there's two ways of doing it we either try and bulldoze our way through this work or we accept that there are you know peaks and troughs in the way that we all think creatively the way that we solve problems and if we can work out how to harness that we'll actually be more productive and yet potentially we'll work less hours the, uh, let me put this up because uh, this just came up, and I and I totally agree. By the way, um, in fact, the the engineering firm that I worked in, you know, we were tackling all of these really hard design problems for uh, for the entertainment industry, and you would be faced with this massive challenge, and they decided to put a ping pong table in there, and we would <laughs> and we would honestly we would uh, we would get stuck with this, and we'd have to, you know, really come up with these big solutions, these big problems that just seemed impossible to overcome and the way that we would deal with it would be to just have these big ping pong tournaments uh and i can tell you that you're right like there's something in the back of your mind that just never sleeps and it's yep. always calculating and then you just gotta like trust that it's there but before we go any further let me put this up perian said um you know curious actually is this style right mm. balancing productivity and creativity do you think it translates to just any field, not necessarily technology? Yeah, I absolutely do. I mean, a lot of what I learned as an ops manager, as you mentioned, is based on Kaizen, which is kind of 1970s, 1980s Japanese um, uh, improvement process. And it, it was used by the, the motor industry. It's used by technology. It's, it, it was the, the precursor to, to lean and agile and some of the other project management methodologies that kind of exploded in the 80s and 90s. Um, this kind of thinking, this kind of way of doing stuff, it's not industry sp specific because it's ultimately about productivity as a whole and teams. Like it could be anything. It could be, you know, a chain of dentists or it could be a, a massive insurance company or it could be, a, you know, an independent agency that's operating out of a couple of different locations. It's the same basic principles of, um, yeah, trying to trying to blend the creative, trying to nurture the most out of the team, trying to build a sense of culture and, and trying to uh, process and improve productivity because ultimately as a business owner, you want maximum margin, you want maximum profit. So if you can actually see the direct correlation between profit and happy, productive team, then that's where the business explodes. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's not, and it's probably anyway, not just one correlation. You end up having to make all these little evolutionary changes, and experimentation and trying to find because the human dynamic, the human psyche is just so versatile. It's just so multifaceted. So you just never know what's going what's gonna to work with people. And so you just have to just have fun with it in, in some way, right? Well, so if you and your experience were to paint the picture of someone trying to make this happen, trying to allow people to be as creative as they can, but also understanding that, like you said, productive time isn't necessarily sitting in front of the computer and cranking out seven and a half hours of work. Yeah. It's letting people breathe a little bit. Um, if you just tried this consistently, right, just a little bit, day after day, but you try to do it consistently, and let's just say hypothetically it was for 30 days, where would they end up in your mind? I think they would probably... Well, in ninety nine percent of the cases that I've worked on, they would end up with a more streamlined system from a business point of view. You would end up with uh, a deeper level of trust and communication with the team members, and you'd effectively end up with a much leaner process for doing whatever it is that your business actually does. There is that uh, Pareto's principle of eighty twenty, where 
probably 20% of all of the business's profits that, um, you know, come from a, a, a very small proportion. Uh, sorry, 80% come from 20% yeah, of the yeah. work done and vice versa. Like there's a whole load of waste in the system. Um, if you get all of your team dialed up to working together, to being more productive, and you're very careful about how you navigate, not hammering out all of the creativity and, and fun you know, you don't just turn it into a horrible sausage machine that's just churning work out. But if you can find that balance, within 30 days, you will end up with more flexibility, greater profitability, and a happier team. And from a happier team comes um, more susceptibility to actually coming up with cool ideas and be more passionate and involved in what it is that they're actually doing. If you treat people like garbage, they will probably just do the nine to five. If you actually, you know, make them feel really involved in the process and make them enjoy the experience of overcoming problems and doing stuff, then they will do that so much faster and so much more powerfully. How have you found is the best way to tell somebody that, that their idea isn't a good one? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know how else to say it. Like, uh, like if you let people do that, if you give them that space and they're as creative as they possibly can be, and sometimes, sometimes it goes a little too far, right? And they maybe overstep or they, you know, they just come up with something completely off the wall that, that they feel maybe will be beneficial for the company. But in your leadership capacity, you have to say, make an executive decision and say, eh, no, no, no. Have you found of like, yeah, how do you like, how do you harness, how do you harness that fire almost in people and, and contain it, but at the same time, like let it burn? Yeah, it's a tricky one. And a lot of it comes down to the planning. So trying to work out, you know, a little bit like bowling with the lanes or like swimming with the lanes, that kind of thing is trying yeah. to work out like, what are our lanes? Uh, you know, how how far over the, the line are we actually prepared to go and how much do we need to stick in our lane? A lot of that comes back to the business strategy again. You know, where are we headed? We don't want to head off completely over there. So we've got to know roughly where the boundaries are. And quite often that means designing those boundaries. But if you get somebody that starts to, you know, step over those, part of it is appreciating the fact that they've had the energy and the tenacity to do that but secondly, reminding them that perhaps it's not where we're headed right now. So it's something that you want to pick up and park. It's trying to turn that situation into a positive where you stick a flag in it because it might be something that you want to come back to at some point. You don't want to completely negate or make people feel like an idiot for thinking outside of the box. But at the same time, you kind of got to remind them that, you know, we're, we're heading in this direction and we all know roughly what our boundaries are. This is something that we could use, but maybe it's something that's not on our roadmap right now. It's incredible how much psychology there is in, in all of this. You know, most people, I guess, when they just think, hey, I'm going to start a business, they, it, it's very black and white. Like, here's the formula. It's extremely formulaic, right? Just start a business, be profitable, et cetera. But as you grow, you're no longer using tools to achieve things. Now you're using people essentially, right? You're, you're bringing everybody into the fold and, uh, and the amount of psychology and empathy that you need as a leader is just, it always impresses me um, when people do that well. Yeah. So, so this, I mean, so this is, this is amazing. I mean, I've, I've learned a ton out of this conversation. This has been really good. Uh, <laughs> so let's, so tell me a little bit about what you got going on these days. Uh, how, if people, want to ask you some questions if they want to get in touch with you they want to hire you they want to chopper you in uh <laughs> their next meeting like how do people do that uh probably the easiest thing is through i've, I've got a, a page online i mean I, i'm all over social media anyway but i've got a page online where people can just book a call it's a really really simple little page pick a day pick a time if my calendar's free if your calendar's free we chat and that i've never sold that's an important thing. I don't sell at people. I don't pitch at people. I listen to people. If I can give them some advice or help them with something, then I do so. And, and most, probably 90% of all of the clients and partners that I've got have been through a process of just trying to understand what it is somebody's trying to achieve and then try to help them on that journey. And, and, and you know, the, the relationship naturally progresses. So I, I, I open my calendar up on a regular basis to people and just say, look, if you've got half hour spare, grab a coffee, 
book a session, let's chat. And you're like, you know, you're, you're approaching the scene as a friend, not yeah. or somebody, not necessarily some, you know, slick haired car salesman that's trying to <laughs> get them. You well, know. Honestly, I mean, you and I are both connected in similar circles to various people. I did some training when I first launched the agency because I believed that I needed to do this stuff. And I did a whole load of sales training and I got my, you know, my corporate suit back out and I did the LinkedIn profile thing and all the rest of it. And I felt sleazy as hell. And I remember my wife and my daughter saying to me, like, what are you doing? This is not you. You know, you're trying to hit all these targets and you're trying to be the salesman and blah, blah, blah. And like, it doesn't work. And I, I just remember every time I looked at those training materials and, you know, watched the the YouTube videos that these guys were doing. And, and it's just like, no, nah, this is so unnatural. You and people, slightly die inside, you know? Well, yeah, and, and, and people can smell it. They can smell the fear and the lack of confidence and the lack of being natural and all the rest of it. So I, I just burned all of those books and thought, <laughs> you know what? Just talk to people. Just talk to them and see what happens. Do you find that that approach, um, that that approach works well because the majority of your uh, business comes from referrals, or have you also tried to incorporate that in um, in cold outreach to people? Yeah, cold as well. I, yeah, I, I've last well, probably the end of last year, I just put out a few things on social media and said, "Look, if you connected with me, you know, I'm opening up my calendar. Go grab it." And there were low, I think there were about 15 people that were connected to me, but we would got no relationship. They just came forward and said, "Hey, you know, I'm thinking of doing this. Or can I pick your brain on that?" Blah 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 blah. Do the same with LinkedIn. I do the same with email occasionally. I don't do a lot of cold outbound. Most of it is referral, either from client to client or from partner to partner or whatever else. And a lot of it is strategic partnership work. But it's the same process. It's like, you know, if we can talk, if I can help, if you feel that it's valuable, there may be some reciprocation in the future. Let's keep talking. You know, it's a very... Some digital marketers out there will probably have a heart attack when they look at my process. Yeah. But it, it's not stopped the success because it comes down to being, you know, true to you and your process and just being honest and consistent. Seriously, man, for everybody listening right now, don't just listen to Rob's words here, but but watch what he does. Honestly, I encourage everybody to follow Rob and what he's doing because because you're just a great person to emulate. I mean, not just to learn from as far as these processes are concerned, but just watching you do what you do. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed, man. I, like, I think that it's, it's inspirational. I hope that it's been inspiring for everybody listening. It's just been great, man, this entire conversation. Yeah, loved it. it it's gone too fast, my friend, but hey. <laughs> yeah, it's already been almost 45 minutes. Can you believe that? <laughs> And by the way, before we go, <laughs> let me put this up. Perian, Perian wants to know, before Rob leaves, what did your mom say about the tats when she saw them? Oh, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty bad. I think it was something along the lines of, what the hell have you done? Why did you do that? Is that permanent? Uh yeah, you, you can imagine, you know, the whole thing. There's somebody that's very anti-tattoo, that's very straight-laced and conservative, I guess. You know, I love it to bits, but she 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 didn't understand. And I was at that age where I shouldn't have been doing that sort of stuff. So it was, yeah, it was a, a, an interesting few weeks. And it was one of those as well where it's like every time I went out with her after, I was, you know, mindful of wearing longer T-shirts because I didn't want a reminder and spark that argument again <laughs> so. right just trigger her again yeah 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 well how long how long before you got your next tattoo after that oh uh it's probably about five years i think it's it's one of these work in progress i mean a lot of this one on this arm's completely uncolored it's you know one of those things where i keep saying to my tattooist i'll come back and then life gets in the way and yeah yeah dude but i love i love that they tell a story like the tattoos uh, you know, nothing worse than having somebody just, I mean, that happens in Key West actually quite a bit where they've got these tattoo parlors and you just, these drunk tourists will come in and they'll, they'll say, oh, give me number uh, 37. And you're yep. just like, oh man, you sure you want to do that? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but dude, honestly, this has been so good talking with you. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, I'm wondering, do you have, before we go, any parting words for folks? Anything you want to leave people with, uh, the listeners right now? 
I would just say, uh, I guess, think about where your business is going, but think about who's going to help you get there. You know, whether it's just you and your founder or whether it's an entire team or whatever else, you can make more out of what you've got if you lean into the team and you actually help them grow. They will help move the dial on your business. And those goals that you have as a business owner are achievable with the team that you have. You just got to work out how to bring the worlds together. Dude, Rob, you're the man. Seriously, this has been <laughs> great. This has been awesome. So, Thanks, uh, yeah, thank you for taking the time, for coming on the show, for sharing all these insights. Thank you, everybody that's listening right now. Um, again, go check out Rob. If you want to speak with him, the link is in the description of this video. It's also in the, wherever you're listening to this, the link is in the description. So that will be there. Click that, have a conversation, have a coffee. And honestly, Rob, thanks again, man. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care. All right, guys. Well, this is Rob and Josh signing off another episode of Firebuilders Live. Thank you so much. And, uh, we will catch you next time. Adios.